Well, hello and welcome to Trading Blows. Plenty to discuss on the show this week, including what the surprisingly cool US inflation data means for both the markets and the Fed's policy outlook going forwards. How the economy is evolving here in the UK after a raft of economic releases this week. And we'll also look at geopolitical risk and whether that remains a key focus for markets and traders alike. A busy show ahead, so without further ado, let's get into things. So lots for us to discuss this week. Let's bring our panellists straight into the show. As always, they'll be going head-to-head over four rounds, scoring points for a great response. And the threat of points being chalked off, of course, looms over them if a dispute is raised over their answer. Of course, the uh, the better their answer, the more points they will score. Uh, Joining us on the show this week, Arno Venter, market analyst at Capital Edge, Ryan Paisy, the founder of PIQ Suite, and last but by no means least, Adam Linton, the head of the European desk over at New Squawk. With the panellists on the show and the rules now clear, let's get into the first round. So uh, there's really only one place we can start uh, today's show, and that is with the inflation data that we had out of the United States this week. Clearly much cooler than expected and a chunky reaction seen across the board. Equities up 2% or so in the United States, the dollar having its worst day in a year on Tuesday. Um, Adam, let's start with you, seeing as you were the one who asked me to rewrite this question. Um, what are your thoughts on what the inflation number means for, for markets and for the Fed going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, the, the messaging from the CPI report we saw yesterday and then the PPI one we've subsequently seen around about 10 minutes ago with this being recorded on a Wednesday, there's not really much nuance to the release. It's a cool level of inflation. But You know, I think the main takeaway is not to get too carried away with this kind of rate of decline. And in fact, I think it was Fed's Barkin, was it, that came out after and said that inflation is not going to glide path to 2%. And, you know, also core could be a bit more stickier. That's still on a 4% handle. Some parts of the US, you know, labor market is still relatively hot. So it's not to get kind of carried away with kind of what we saw yesterday. It's potential that yesterday was a little bit of an outsized reaction. But in terms of what we kind of have seen, we saw the market, which is already relatively dovish, as I think we mentioned last week, whereby it's looking for 75 basis points of rate cuts. That's now extended to 100 basis points of rate cuts. And, you know, for now, that seems to be as dovish as it can get, because as we were talking about last week, the Fed's kind of communication strategy is very much at loggerheads with that of the um, US market. And up until last week, we kind of had this game which we talked about where the Fed was trying to talk up the possibility of another rate hike. The market kind of laughed at it, but still signed around about a 25% chance of a hike in January. But now, you know, that's just com- been completely taken off the table. They're done with rate hikes as far as I'm concerned. And therefore, they need to shift the narrative to 2024 and push back on how dovish the pricing is for rate reductions. And, you know, we'll see Fed comms do a lot of the heavy lifting. But then also, I'm sure the one of the most interesting inflection points will be the dot plot in December, which, you know, the current dot plot looks for two rate cuts, um, assuming they had another one rate hike, which would be one rate cut from current levels so the markets you read in my notes because you've literally mentioned (laughs) every bullet point i've got so far okay well i'll I'll try i'll try wrap up quickly but my point is there's a huge gulf in difference between one rate cut for 2024 and four and you know the fed is going to have to try and push back relatively hard on this because again as we discussed last week the big concern is the easing of financial conditions and we said last week they could possibly possibly leave a rate hike on the table but again you know i think that's completely done so it's a case of watching see how hard they push back on the market and yeah if they do push back and then the us data like the growth data does begin to roll Mm -hmm. over that's potentially the worst of all worlds for the market because as we've mentioned you know time and time again even if they don't hike policy will be getting incrementally higher by real yields, QT, and the policy lag. So, you know, I think the market did get carried away because also, and another point I think I mentioned last week as well, is that 
you know, even if they do cut rates by 25 base points, 50 basis points here, they're still in restrictive policy. This isn't policy mm. easing. It's just more of a fine tuning. And even if they do 25, 50, they're not really necessarily going to be at a neutral level. So, yeah, I think the, fact the market got a little bit carried away yesterday. Yeah, definitely. Well, Ryan, before anyone else steals any more of your points, why don't we bring you in? Do you, do you agree? Do you think the market got a bit carried yeah, away? Yeah, what he said. Can I have the same number of points? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, totally what Adam said. Um, you know, especially like, yeah, with the dot plots, I think the dot plots could, you know, when we talk about heavy lifting and Fed speak and that, I think the dot plots going to be carrying a hell of a lot of weight. Uh, was it December thirteenth when they uh, when that all that comes out? Yeah. Um, I think one thing as well to be mindful of again, as Adam said, let's not get carried away. There's also an absolute shed load of base effects kind of in there as well. You know, the quicker you go up, the quicker you come back down, kind of thing. Um, so yeah, be mindful of that. Um, yeah, what, what else could I say? Um, I think someone was mentioning yesterday that January looks on track to be the fastest one year peacetime decline in CPI in, in uh, on year, uh, one year peacetime decline in more than 40 years, which is a great stat, but yeah, it's base effects, right? So was that January 2024, you mean? Yeah, yes. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but yeah, what a high place to come off from. Um, mm -hmm. In regards to what kind of following on from what Adam said about mm -hmm. um, narrative and how recently it shifted to uh, sorry, Fed speak and how uh, the narrative kind of took on a more of a, a hawkish tone of late. Um, personally, I'm a big believer in the fact that the narrative you hear at the Fed will always be counter to what the overwhelming narrative of the market is, because their job is to try and you know balance everything up. Think of it in terms of mean reversion, right? When you're looking at markets, that's kind of like what, in my opinion, what the Fed like to do with narratives. So if people are getting far too carried away on a dovish stance and the market starts going overly dovish, of course, they're going to come back in and like, you know, just try and counter that with a bit of hawkish tone. Same when the market is overly hawkish, they'll come in and be a little bit more dovish. It's, you know, their whole process is to try and balance everything out in terms of, you know, how the market perceives what they're going to do forward and how, you know, just, you know, try and kind of rein it in. So I think that's, you know, as soon as the market starts getting overly, you know, dovish, they go hawkish and vice versa. I do agree with Adam that markets might have gone a little, got a little bit carried away, but at the same time, you know, path of least resistance has been higher and, yeah. you know, the market's just looking for any excuse whatsoever to go and to scream higher. Um, yeah, I know it's, this isn't uh, an equities section, but, you know, it all comes down to equities, right, uh, for most people in terms of retail traders. Do you um, happen to be bullish US equities by the by any chance, right? <laughs> always, mate. Always. <laughs> you know, like yeah, you, know, you can you imagine how many people or how many funds and stuff are not as long as maybe they perhaps should be. Yeah, you know, you've got year end coming up. Yeah, you know, they're they're gonna have to yeah, if they haven't already kind of piled in after the CPI, they're gonna have to start piling in towards the end of the year because there's a lot of people underperforming. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, and this this CPI number, and obviously we're going on to policy next, but yeah, I think there's a lot of people kind of trapped, a lot of funds and whatever, uh, trapped kind of not as long as they should be. Um, but just kind of, yeah, just to finish up in terms of the how we're looking at the data, yeah, it's it's position A, it's the Goldilocks for, for the Fed because we've got slowing inflation, slowing labour market, the economy slash stock market is holding up slash screaming higher for the stock market. Um, yeah, I think, you know, you can draw a line under hikes, then we're not going to see many more of them, well, none of them. Unless something drastic happens, um, roll on June for the first cut. That's June, cool. yeah. Well, well, there we go. Ryan's uh, already come out of the traps with a, a call for the Fed to cut for a penny. So, Arno, what are your thoughts on uh, the inflation data? I mean, a hundred basis points worth of cuts near as makes no difference that markets are now pricing in for twenty twenty four. Are you thinking that's overblown, or are you thinking that actually, with this disinflationary trend now intact, seemingly that that could actually be delivered? No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, <clears throat> I think the first thing the the most the most entertaining thing about yesterday's CPI's reaction was seeing how market participants reacted to it because it seems like the many, many hated the move. Um, I mean, they hated the whole CPI. equity CPI. <laughs> exactly, you know, it, it's they hated the whole equity move really from uh, FMC. So I think everybody kind of assumed that it would come in higher and then assumed that equity should be falling if inflation comes in higher. 
Um, you know, some saying that the data is fake because they forecasted a higher number. But of course, you know, if the data came in higher as expected, then the data wouldn't have been fake anymore, right? So it's only <laughs> fake when it's not, when it doesn't suit your narrative type of thing. Um, so I think that was the most interesting thing. Um, and like Ryan said, you know, the path of least resistance here is interesting because if you have that type of reaction, it shows you that the markets got massively caught off guard yesterday. You know, that was a typical, typical reaction to the players just not being ready for the type of reaction that we got. Um, you know, you, I mean, you can skin it away any way you want and try and explain it, saying that it was this way or that way. At the end of the day, you know, if you are just a degenerate risk event trader like me, the move made a lot of sense because you had all four measures coming in lower than what the markets had anticipated. If you take a look at the forecast distribution across the, the four measures, we literally had the smallest number of participants that expected that print yesterday. And again, if you take a look at positioning data, whether that's on the dollar, whether it's on CTAs in terms of equities, the markets weren't ready for that type of print. So that's the first thing that I just want to you know, say is that the reaction, we shouldn't just, every time that it doesn't fit our narrative, we can't blame the data and say, oh, but you know, it's, it's those fudge data points. Um, but anyway. <laughs> right. So just to kind of interject a little bit, it's like, you know, fine, like be like, have be annoyed at the method methodology of how it's decided. That's fine. That's yeah. one thing, right? But to to call the numbers fake or whatever, you know, there's, there's no way that they are fake, right? No. Yes, they might be calculated in a manner that you don't agree with. Yeah. That's not the same yeah. as fake numbers. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, the thing is, it wouldn't have been fake numbers if it came in higher, like everybody yeah, exactly. expected it to, right? It's only yeah. fake when you lose money on it type of thing. But anyway, um, in terms of you know what this means for the Fed, I do fully agree that this is, I think the markets have gotten way too far. And it's, it's we'll get to that in a second, but I don't think it's just the Fed. I mean, 100 basis points is crazy. And to think, you know, May, May feels far away, you know, we're <laughs> five, six months away from that. Do we really think that the situation in the economy will deteriorate that much by, you know, in five months' time? Look, it's possible, but at this rate of change that we've seen for whether it's growth, which is still very positive, whether it's the labor market that is slowing, but very, very slowly, um, and inflation that has this steady, but, you know, slow disinflation, I just, I think the market's got crazy, crazy overexcited on the rate side. But, you know, in terms of, we need to always think about how the markets view these types of things, right? This was just one more thing in a whole range of tailwinds that risk assets had to deal with over the last couple of weeks, right? We first had the QRA announcement, which the market saw as a positive, especially since it relieved some of the stress about the bond market. Mm -hmm. Then we had the FMC, which in my opinion, wasn't really overly dovish or hawkish. They were pretty balanced, but it wasn't them pushing back against, um, you know, the moves that we had in terms of yields. That was quite interesting. You know, they, they stressed that higher yields, you know, was doing their job for them. And when yields came down, they just quietly kind of didn't say anything about it. I'm not sure if you uh, caught up to that, but they didn't really push back against that by any means. So I think that was all positive for equity markets. Um, but yeah, I do think it's too aggressive for the Fed, but I don't, eventually that could be a negative for markets. But there's just too many, you know, tailwinds uh, in favour for for stage. No, very much so. I mean, there there is one group of people out there who don't think that that is too aggressive a pace, and that is, I think, UBS, who have put their notes out saying the Fed funds rate is going to be at what one one and a half percent in early 2025. But wow. uh, I think, apart from them, uh, everyone is pretty much in the camp that it is a little bit over the top. But we're going to get yeah. onto policy a little bit more in the second round of the show. So, uh, Ryan, we'll start with you actually on, on this one in terms of monetary policy, not just with the Fed, but also elsewhere. You know, the market's now gone really overboard in pricing cuts from the Fed, as we've just discussed. You've got 70, 80 basis points worth of cuts priced in for the BOE now, who I know we'll get onto in, in a second. Do you think that, you know, this is now a game, particularly in the FX space of who is going to cut first? And that's really the, the big macro theme everyone's going to be trading off for the next six, nine months or so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> I was hoping for a little bit more, but yeah. yeah. Um, no, I think you know it's like you said. It's it's all eyes on like central banks now, right? Um, 
I think the interesting one is, to be honest, I've got no interest in the Bank of England at the moment. Um, I think the interesting one is obviously Bank of Japan. Um, you know, they, they're kind of going the, the wrong way, well, the, a different way, should we say, maybe not the wrong way. Um, you know, well. looking for Q1, looking for the first hike that for God knows how long. Um, but again, let's be mindful that it's, you know, it's, that's only just bringing it at negative rates. It's not like, you know, a whopping, uh, a whopping move higher. Um, but I just kind of on the Fed itself, I think, yeah, where I said just now that I think we'll see a cut in, in June, um, that's not because I believe there should be one. That's just because I think we will see one. Um, because if we, we've spoke about in the past, you know, it's the rate of change in the rates is, has been the real killer, right? That's where the, the pain has come from the rate of change, not the, the, the level that the rates are at. Yeah. Rates aren't high. If we look historically, rates are not high at the moment. They're just higher than zero, which is where, you know, they should never have been at zero in the first place. So if we see, you know, if we see rates don't move for a protracted period of time, an extended period of time, that pain will subside the longer we don't move. So we could see, you know, you know, May, June or whatever, you know, rates have not, you know, for the Fed, for example, rates haven't moved and it's no big deal anymore. People have got used to it. It's, you know, it's, and therefore, you know, if the economy's doing fine, there's no need to hike, uh, sorry, no need to cut. Um, mm. However, Bank of Japan are kind of in a bit of a difficult place and they will have to hike. Um, you know, we've seen the change in that. I know we spoke about this last week, you know, the change in language, you know, Adam, if I remember rightly, kind of was convinced that they're just kind of, using the language as a tool, which of course they are, but we've seen some, you know, some definite shifts in kind of the tone out of the Bank of Japan that is it's not by accident, right? They've kind of, you know, they've, they've kind of loosened the YCC kind of um, rigmarole and, you know, it's, it's kind of only a matter of time really before they hike. In terms of ECB, I think... <laughs> ECB are in a very difficult position. I would argue that they're in the most difficult position because Germany are, you know, struggling, to, should we say? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was trying not to swear on purpose. <laughs> I was kind of struggling for a word that wasn't a swear word. Um, so yeah, Germany. There's a load of pressure, as we spoke about last week as well. You know that, you know they they could if any central if any major central bank out there could do with cutting, it's the ECB. Um, mm. But you know, will they? Won't they? It's, it's not on the cards. Um, yeah, I just, you know, it, I don't want to call any news because I'm, you know, couldn't pick me nose, let alone a winning trade at the moment. Um, but, yeah, I haven't really got much else to say, to be honest. It's well, just, I was just, just going to say, uh, the, the other thing is, if if you are saying the Fed are going to cut in June or, or even July, at, at that point, you know, we all agree that the, the hiking cycle is over. So, at that point, you're going to have been at terminal for as near as makes no difference a year. Um, so, actually, it, it may not be as far-fetched a call as, as we were making out well, earlier. Like I said, yeah, uh, if, if, we, if we stay at that terminal rate for a year, yeah, most of the pain has subsided because yeah. rates are just flat. So, you know... In, in my opinion, we don't need to cut, but you know, there's so much pressure on them to cut, even though there's nothing wrong with the economy. We'll see. Well, exactly. We've seen the market bully policymakers before, and I'm sure we'll exactly. see markets give it a, give it another try. Um, Adam, what are your thoughts on on the on the outlook, particularly in terms of you know we're, we're all sat here talking about rate cuts, but what's going to be the driver of cuts? Is it going to be inflation? Is it going to be uh, coming down? Is it going to be labour market softening? Is it going to be growth really rolling over in a, a significant way or something else entirely? Um, you know, I mean, I think in terms of kind of the central bank, I think there's like nuance to each central bank. It's not one like sort of homogenous cycle that we're in. Homogenous. If you take, you know, for example, the ECB. Word, you, can have, you can have a bonus point for that. Oh, piss off. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, it, like I work on the European desk, so let's you know let's take the ECB. Oh, really, yes. that one you. You, know, you never mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> so you know they they paused at the last meeting, and you know at the end of the day, we've kind of talked at length in previous episodes about why that is. The growth outlook's pretty terrible. They're confident inflation's returning to target. Then if you look at something such as you know the ECB Bank Lending Survey, their rate hikes are clearly transmitting into the economy. But again, similar to the Fed and similar to all G10 central banks, they're all doing this charades where they're talking that, you know, if we need to hike one more time, we will. But I think, you know, for a lot of these central banks, we know the game is up. And, you know, I think we need to see kind of how things play out with the ECB. But as I was mentioning before, 
rate cuts when they come for central banks like the ECB aren't necessarily stimulus. They're just less restrictive. And therefore, you know, I think when they do come, you know, I think it'll be for the ECB, it'll be of the growth outlook. But for ECB specifically, I think there's an interesting policy mix where if you're an FX trader, for example, you need to really consider what they're doing with their balance sheet at the same time. So obviously, they'll be needing to end some of the PEP reinvestments, which is going to be, I think, a key theme for 2024 for watching ECB policy. And, you know, how does the Eurozone economy handle that if it's also slowing at the same time? Because, you know, do we get the return of the dreaded word fragmentation that was part of everyone's oh, lexicon man. last year? Lexicon. And therefore, you know, as they're kind of unwinding their balance sheet, uh, where typically that would be bullish for a currency, for the euro, could that potentially be a headwind as, the, you know, as they're cutting rates and as growth slowing? So I think it's a, a tough policy mix for the euro next year. And then I know we'll touch on the Bank of England, but there's also nuance there as well. The fact that, you know... You use we, that word already, mate. Sorry, you ain't getting a bonus point for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, obviously, the key themes to watch there, which we'll talk on, are things like service inflation, wage growth, not necessarily GDP as much, because I, I always say central bankers aren't necessarily paid for that. But for the UK, there's a lot of housing interest rate risk. We have a lot of floating rate more, we have a lot of fixed rate mortgages and when they get refinanced, that could be a potential headwind for the UK. So I think we might be in a position where we see the Bank of England slightly more march into the tune of its own beat relative to the ECB, relative to the Fed. But ultimately, I think it's going to be a case of, I don't think it's going to be a huge discrepancy in terms of when they do start cutting rates. And at that point... Who cuts you know, first, right? Question, question to the group. Who cuts first, Fed or ECB? ECB. Yeah, ECB. Anna, if there's going to be cuts, it's going to be ECB, yeah. Be go. Because, like okay. I said, they've, they've, they've got... Really got the, we're all in agreement, right? <laughs> they, they need to start... They need to think about unwinding their balance sheet. So, that you know, they need... To ease the pain of that, they're going to have to cut rates. But, yeah. you know, I think for now, inflation data is interesting to see when the first rate cut will come. But if everyone's cutting at the same time, then I think the growth dynamic becomes even more important in which case you probably think that would favour the US. I mean, US growth for this whole cycle has held up so much better. We've talked about the Eurozone being weak, but then the Bank of England are forecasting no growth for next year. And then, as Ryan said, you've got this wild card that is the BOJ amongst all of this. Well, who, you only just get onto the BOJ. Give me a shout when you're done. <laughs> well, if you stop <laughs> interrupting... <laughs> Yeah, like Ryan said, I think the BOJ is probably the most interesting story. And I've I've talked about it numerous times before, them being the hawkish outlier. I don't necessarily see it. Their policy at the moment tends to be more geared towards protecting the yen. So from a trade perspective, I think the Japanese yen potential strength versus a weaker euro could be one to watch for next year. Yeah, definitely. I, I think we would all agree on that. And, you know, kudos to yourself, because you were one of the first I heard, at least, to, to actually, uh, you know, raise your disputes with uh, the idea that the BOJ are going to be this hawkish outlier and it's going to be massively bullish for the yen. And, well, certainly hasn't proved to be the case throughout much of this year. Um, Arno, amid all of that, what is the trade in FX? We've all sat here and said the ECB are going to be the first to cut. So do we just <laughs> go short euro? Uh, man, not yet. I mean, the thing is, I mean, in terms of, you know, when it comes to FX, that's always really the play that we have to work with, right? It's always going to be policy differentials. A couple of months ago, it was who's going to be, who's going to hike the most. Then it was who's going to stop first. Now it's who's going to keep it higher for longer or who's going to cut first. So I think that theme is always going to be in play when you look at, uh, when you look at FX markets. I think what we need to be watching right now, <clears throat> and this is where, you know, I'm not I'm not so sure we're going to get cuts as soon because we would need both growth and inflation to show us the same thing. And, you know, it, it's a mashup between the two because on the one hand, let's just assume that growth and labor tanks and it's super, super bad, but inflation is still 4%. The bank is on going to hike uh, uh, cut rates even if growth is bad, if inflation is still 4%, because think about it from an optics perspective, how on earth will they be able to justify a cut even if growth falls, but inflation is still twice or whatever they target? On the other hand, let's just say inflation drips lower aggressively, which I don't think it will. I think it's going to be- Drips aggressively. <laughs> Did you say drips aggressively? Drips lower aggressively? 
Yeah, I mean, if it if it well, it falls, falls aggressively, or not. <laughs> it either drips or is aggressive. One of the two, <laughs> mate. Let's say it tanks, right? Oh, there we go. Go. <laughs> if it tanks, but growth is okay, like like Ryan said earlier, then why would you have to cut rates if that happens, right? If inflation is low and growth is holding up there. Isn't that like the perfect environment that, you know, they want to be having, you know? I mean, the golden environment would be this inflation, you know, inflation just slows down a little bit, you know, gets close to target, but growth stays okay. The labor, you know, we're expecting growth to slow. We're expecting the labor market to slow, but it's like, you know, it's, that doesn't mean we're going to have this, you know, 08 collapse and everything is just going to go to shit. You know, it, 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 we could actually see things, you know, going stably. And if that happens, I just don't see them having to hike rates. So I think what's going to be difficult next year is that if it's just down, if it was just down to growth or just down to inflation, it would be easy. But right now, we need that perfect environment between the two. We need growth to be seriously bad and inflation to be low enough for them to cut. And I'm not sure whether we're going to have that dynamic in play in the next, you know, five or six months. I mean, that's. That's what the hike is like far too logically, and the markets aren't looking at the banks aren't logical. I mean, that's no. true, but I mean, you can't cut rates if you had 4%, even if growth is down, right? Know, but what I'm hoping to see, and what I'm really, and you know, I'm not just saying this, what I'm hoping to see is that we get this stable disinflation, but growth slows, but it stays okay. Labor slows, but it stays okay. You know, there's far <laughs> too many of these macro people out there that wants the world to implode every single day. It's like, you just, you wait, you know. We'll see who laughs, you know. It's like, yeah, okay, but why would you want that? You know, maybe, just maybe, this loathed and hated soft landing scenario, maybe it's not that far-fetched. No maybe landing, you, mate, no landing. You know, maybe we get there, you know, um, because like Ryan and Richard have said many, many times, you know, we've, 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 we, we are now in a situation where we feel higher rates isn't normal, but it's the lower bound that isn't normal, you know. So hmm. yeah, I, I'm, I'm... I would, I would say, I would push back those expectations a bit because I think there's the, the the right situation might not be there for both growth and inflation to see that happen. Um, but there's obviously the way that you're going to trade that is the first one to puke will be the one to trade. You know, and it's you don't you don't trade that as the bank cuts rates. The markets will tell us where that's going to happen. Right, we'll see that in the data. We'll watch the differentials as always, growth and inflation differentials. That's going to be the trade. But right now, you know, if you ask me who's going to cut first, if there is going to be cuts, it's going to be the ECB. But the other wild card we need to think about, right, is China. Yes, mm. made up data. But if the made up data is going to be made up slightly better in the next couple of months, that could be perceived as a positive for the Eurozone. Um, so I'm just I'm not as I'm not as um, strong on the on the cuts right now. Um, which which makes it tricky. There's, we'll talk about sterling in uh, in the next section. I think that's going to be the more interesting one to watch. But for now, I think in the short term, the way that we've been you know playing this as we always do is just looking at those short term differentials where you can get advantage, where the market is mispriced. Um, right now, I think that is on the Aussie side. But again, we'll we'll touch on that in um, in the uh, in the next section. I, yes, I think, definitely. I think hold that thought, and uh, we will get on to that next section now, shall we? Yes. So as Arno said, uh, we are going to dig into the UK outlook and the pound and UK assets generally. So there's only one man we can go to for that, and that is the world's biggest sterling bull, Mr. Brian Paisley. What do you make of all the data that we've had out over the last couple of days? Not much, to be honest, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, Same. <laughs> yeah, you are. I could, like, UK data is kind of wonderfully overlooked at the moment. And, uh, you know, and you can't really blame people for doing that. I think it's more of a more eyes on the political mess that's unfolding. Um, yeah, it's 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 a difficult one. I, I think what forgetting the data as it, it stands, yeah, you know, it's it's not really telling us overly too much more than you know the, than the data we're seeing in Europe and the US, really. Um, and obviously, you know, it's, it's very much a global affair. Um, but kind of, I know this is meant to be talking about data, but I'm going to kind of only briefly touch on this and then move on to something else, you know, how I like to kind of do my own little thing. Um, one thing to note, I think it's quite an interesting stat, is consumer prices in Britain have increased 21% since the end of 2020, um, and which is the worst on record in, uh, sorry, the worst in Western Europe. So, nice little record breaker for you there. Um, 
but with all this, you know, we've seen some, you know, CPIs coming out lower and whatnot. Um, I think it's quite interesting that, you know, the BOE chief economist, uh, Hugh Peel, stressed it yesterday, and rightfully so, that it's, you know, inflation is still far too high. They're nowhere near cutting. Um, you know, and why would they cut? I think more importantly, and I think this is something more, you know, we, we should be focusing on more than any of this backward looking data that we're, we're seeing coming out for sterling traders is the fact that because uh, Sunak is in such a mess at the moment, and you know, we've got an election, you know, it's not that far away, um, you know, creeping up on us, a UK election creeping up on mm. us, that, yeah, we could be seeing some, I think we'll be expecting some quite substantial fiscal moves coming out. You know, I know that the whole cliche about tax and spend, but I think it's gonna be more like tax cuts and spend because yeah, you know, they they're gonna have to you know pull out some some big guns to kind of you know win over the win over the public at the moment. And we got the the UK budget on November twenty second. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but I'm like autumn talking. statement, not budget. Oh, sorry, autumn uh, statement. Yeah, ner- sure ner- nerd alert, nerd alert went off there. I was gonna say sorry about that. Um, yeah. I don't know if I mentioned. It, I turned forty on the twenty first of November. Just want to get oh. that. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, yeah. So I think that's that. You know, I think we're looking at that to be very very business friendly. Um, because it needs to be. Um, so, you know, I'd be looking at that side of things, the political side of the move and the, f- the fiscal moves that we're going to see more than the data because, you know, we're not seeing much reaction from the data at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I, I'm not one to always kind of like looking at the data, I think, and also, the, you know, with, with revisions and whatnot. But in terms of how the BOE are going to handle it, I think they're kind of in a, you know, much like the Fed, they're kind of in position A at the moment. They can kind of just sit there, they can sit on their hands and just see how everything else unfolds. And, you know, if you are the BOE, it's all about your optionality, right? So, you know, and this is why they use such, why the language is always open to cuts and always open to heights, is because they need to have that optionality. Now, if you're the Bank of England, why are you going to look around? Why are you going to, you know, just because we've had some good data, why... Why are you going to let that impact your next decision or your decision afterwards? When, you know, I know, as Adam said, we've got, you know, the mortgages kind of coming up um, and people are suffering. But then we can go, but then you tie that back to what I said before about it's the rate of change that kill people. Yeah. Um, you know, house prices have turned around. And, you know, I think the UK is maybe a bit of an, an anomaly on the fact that so much um, onus is put on house prices. I'd prefer, you know, personally, I'd prefer to watch house prices than CPI for kind of a gauge of what the Bank of England would be doing next, because it's, you know, it's it's very clear that, you know, keeping house prices stable slash ticking up is one of their kind of the unmentioned mandates of the Bank of England. Um, so until until we start seeing like problems there, which we're not seeing at the moment, I kind of, you know, just buy cable. <laughs> <laughs> That's always Ryan's trade. Always, always be long cable. Um, Adam, what are your thoughts on what's going on? I mean, I, I assume you would have been squawking the data this morning. Sadly, I was stuck on a train. He's on the European desk. I don't know if he's mentioned it before. <laughs> he has one well, before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, headline CPI coming back down under 5%. I would assume the only man happier than Andrew Bailey at this point is uh, Rishi Sunak, because he can go around claiming he's hit one of his five goals. Well, yeah. Didn't you see my uh, tweet earlier making that point? They're taking uh, n- none of the oh, no no responsibility for the upside inflation, but all the credit for the downside. It's a yeah. incredible bit of politics. But in terms of kind of piecing everything we've kind of seen together for the Bank of England this week, I mean, obviously yesterday, well Tuesday, because we're recording this on Wednesday, we saw the UK jobs data, and you know, you got to take that with a bit of a pinch of salt at the moment, as somehow I think our oh, unemployment data is even more unrealistic and unreliable than the Chinese. But in terms of <laughs> in, t- in terms of what we did see, you know, the direction of travel is relatively clear. Yes, you know, things are relatively tight at the moment, but we're beginning to see a bit of waning in some of the price pressures for wages. I think Pantheon came out yesterday and said it's actually near enough broadly on track with a 2% inflation target. And then if you do take things like vacancies and labour scarcity, things are clearly loosening there. And then you kind of couple that with today's you know, UK CPI data. Yes, there's a huge base effect at play here. Ultimately, again, the direction of travel is pretty clear. The all, serv- all um, services component, that was 6.6%. Below the Bank of England, expected 6.9%. So 
so far on Threadneedle Street, they're feeling pretty vindicated with what they're, they've done so far. But, you know, like Ryan said, we're in wait and see mode. There isn't anything they can do at the moment other than just sit on the hands, see how the data plays out and just push back on the notion of rate cuts. We saw that, you know, slip up from Chief Economist Pill last week, which you had to kind of ultimately walk back. They don't really kind of want to entertain the thought because if you take a bank like the Bank of England, I reckon they've probably drawn the most criticism out of the G10s for really failing to get to grips with inflation. So therefore, if you're a central banker and your currency's credibility, you have to be really careful when it comes to cutting rates. And, you know, I think hey, ultimately... No, just, just, just a question for you on that. So, yeah, they took a lot of stick because of inflation and trying to get on top of it. But do you honestly think that if they had hiked more aggressively and quicker, do you honestly think it would have made a big di- difference to the, the inflation? No, I don't, and I'll, I'll tell you that before. I don't think they will. But again, it's not necessarily the outcomes. It's the credibility and the policy intentions mm. to get on top of it. But, but surely it's, it's, you know, it's, it's for them, it, they're not doing it for a popularity contest, right? I just, my argument is... They would have hiked more if the Bank of England would have in the past hiked more aggressively into a higher level. Yeah, inflation wouldn't not, have changed. Yeah, no, but I'm, I'm not saying it was, but I'm saying people's perception of their intent to get on top of it. If there's a September meeting last year in the wake of the mini budget crisis, they could have gone 50, they only went 25, and then they had to keep ratcheting up the pace of rate hikes thereafter. They definitely suffered the credibility. And yes, the outcome might not have been different, but it's policy intentions in which they're judged. Um, so, but ultimately, you know, they're waiting to see kind of how things play out. I don't think we'll have a real guide as to kind of what they'll be doing until late Q1, Q2. And I think, you know, this, there's not really much more you can say. I think we're very much at risk of doing kind of what UBS have done and their, you know, their policy assumptions that they, you know, they look for is it 12 Fed rate cuts consecutively. Not like life doesn't play out in that linear fashion. You know, if there's going to be a potential stumbling block, the Bank of England could be one of the potential targets for that. And so just assuming on this kind of glide path towards neutral isn't necessarily going to play out. I mean, we've seen how sticky services inflation are. And, mm. you know, from a fiscal perspective, as Ryan mentioned, the government wants to do handouts, but they're not going to any big ones because they know they saw exactly what happened to the guilt market when trust tried to play that trick last time. It's going to have to be relatively tight because the debt servicing costs have gone up. And the best that they can do, the only thing they can really do is try to push out some of the spending reductions to the latter half of the forecasts and try to do a little bit in the interim. But there's going to be no big kind of fiscal giveaways. I think things are going to be relatively tight. Uh, uh, so I, I slightly, I slightly do, well, when I, I think giveaway might be a bit of a, a loose term, but so you don't think coming into this election, you don't think we're going to see any big fiscal moves? What's a big fiscal move? Oh, I don't know, you know, some tax cuts or, you know, some something significant to kind of promote investment and business. You don't think we're going to see anything? I don't think, I don't think there's going to be huge giveaways because they can't. Because they're, they're, they're bound what, by their what, own what rules. What you mean by kind of, I, I, yeah. Hang on. I feel like we're going to have to have a whole segment on the fiscal outlook in the UK here. So why don't we park that one? Because it is the autumn statement next come back week. Next week. <laughs> we can come. There you go. Little hook for the viewers to come back and watch us all again. Um, because that is, I mean, we could talk for hours about that one. Um, another, someone else who could talk for hours is Arno. Um, <laughs> so we'll bring you in. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on Sterling here, mate? Where, where are we? I mean, cable got up towards 125 yesterday. Are we thinking we can push through that big figure and, and carry on higher now? Versus the dollar, I think so. Yeah, a cross pair is maybe not. They, they, I think, is slightly different. I mean, I think the reason why we had this non-reaction this week is, firstly, like um, Adam said, we tweeted about it as well, is that the, that we can't trust the Labour data because we can't trust the Labour data. We know the Bank of England isn't looking at the data. So if, if the data that we get isn't going to have any material impact in policy decisions, then we don't have to watch it at all. You know, so that that non reaction exactly. makes a lot right. of sense in terms of what, CPI. Yeah, sorry, sorry, just agree yeah, with you. Yeah, yeah that, that, like I said, that's that's, that's, that's more. Go on, sorry. Go on, <laughs> that, that's more useful, right? Yeah. That's more useful. So I think I think that makes sense why the markets didn't react. The other reason, though, for CPI specifically, you know, we did see a move lower across the board, but I don't think that that isn't going to change the market's view about the Bank of England right now. And 
you know, a, a slowdown in inflation is exactly what the market and the Bank of England is expecting right now. You know, so yes, it was a slightly faster than expected deceleration, but it's still super high. The markets think it's going to go lower. The Bank of England thinks it's going to go lower. So at this stage, I just don't think there's any incentive to really, you know, push sterling lower on the back of that because it's it's exactly what the markets have been expecting for a while now. And obviously, the, the Bank of England has been expecting for a while. You know, the trade to have traded pound on CPI was back in July when we were still trading at super high levels. We had that first huge, massive miss coming in. That was really the, the time to trade it lower on CPI. I think where we are now, that theme is kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of played out to some degree. Now, obviously, as we go into next year and the, the question marks about cuts coming up, that will be more important then. But again, we'll need to see all of those dynamics in play. We can't just look at inflation. We'll need to look at um, growth as well. You know, having said that, I do think that the balance of risk is still tilted to the downside for sterling because fundamentally it is pretty bleak. But you can say that for you can say that for Europe as well. You know, the only real economy that is doing okay right now is the US, and the other one that's quite interesting is um, Australia. You know, if you take a look at if you take a look at City Economic Surprise Index, for example, or you take a look at growth differentials, the market. You can never are, be able to guess where he's moving. Yeah, you? I was, you know, I was thinking exactly that. <laughs> take it. I said, yes, you never know the country he's moving to. Well, look, but I'm, I'm getting there, right? So, Sterling, <laughs> I don't like it fundamentally, right? The one that I do like is the US, but I don't want to trade the dollar right now because I think positioning is a bit stretched there. I think there's more downside potential. So, I don't like cable lower, but one that I do like lower from a fundamental point of view is probably pound Aussie because fundamentally, I don't like Sterling. But if you take a look at Australia, you know, growth differentials have been very good. I think the made up data in China is going to be made up slightly better. You know, we saw that today as well um, in the uh, the retail sales data we got, the industrial production data. Um, I think that could open up some interesting moves to the downside for Pound Aussie. But that's really the only way that I would look to express that view right now. If you take a look at positioning, the markets have have. I mean, they dumped their long positions in sterling at a record pace. It was a massive, massive flush to the downside. But I feel like that move has now played out. You know, I think all of those that were um, offside long, I think they got flushed out. They got punished for it. And where I think now sterling is more at, a, at an equilibrium level. So I would expect actually more upside for cable. But at this level, I would expect more downside for something like Pound Aussie. So there's something for both the bulls and the bears in there. Well, there we go. Good stuff. Uh, right, let's get on to the last round of the show. So I want to finish up this week with uh, geopolitical events. Um, obviously, the, the harrowing images coming out of Israel and Gaza continue, but it would appear that markets have quite sharply reduced their focus on what's going on in the Middle East of late. So if you look at uh, gold, obviously, we've, we've rallied a touch this week as yields have come lower, uh, but it is still considerably off the highs that we saw when, when everything kicked off at the start of October. Um, and WTI and Brent are down almost 20% from the, the highs that we saw back at the start of last month as well. So, um, Adam, do you think that the market might be getting a little bit complacent at this point? Or actually, is is this sort of the, the rational reaction that you would expect when this theme has, has been in place for a while and we, we haven't seen any significant escalation? Yeah, I mean, I think as you, as you mentioned, there's clearly been an unwind of the geopolitical premium that we've seen in crude. You know, at the start of the conflict, there's a fear, you know, that some of the regional proxies are going to get involved and this could expand into something slightly broader. From a, you know, from a market's perspective, if you take a market such as oil, an Israel conflict in of itself isn't necessarily the big deal. It's about what other players could potentially be brought into the fray. And, you know, the new music in the past few days, obviously, as you said, some of the images are horrible. But, you know, hopefully we're getting something towards a prisoner exchange, which could potentially lead to a pause in hostilities. And then, you know, in terms of downside, it's not just geopolitics as well. You know, we talked last week about the data rolling over. There's questions about the China recovery. So there's a macro impulse behind this as well. And then elsewhere in the geopolitical frame, don't forget as well, you know, nobody's really talking about Russia and Ukraine at the moment. And if anything, mm. the only real commodity story out of that at the moment is that Russian oil exports just keep on increasing. So for now, you know, I think that does you know, make sense. But if you take a market like crude, it can easily reverse course pretty quickly and then just trends you know, on a sustained basis the other way. And, you know, if you take the geopolitics of the situation, 
Israel and Ukraine, they're existential conflicts to an extent. So, you know, could there potentially be an escalation at some point? Of course there could. And, you know, Russia, does it, you know, make the energy situation difficult for Europe heading into the winter? That was something we were very much worried about last year. Could they, you know, I know we've diversified away from Russia to an extent, but there are still levers they can pull on that front. And then I think, you know, we've seen all these 2024, you know, world economic outlooks and, you know, Goldie's put theirs out early in the week. And they're actually relatively bullish on commodities. And that's, you know, in part as, you know, monetary policy impulse begins to kind of pull back a little bit. And, you know, and if you're bullish on the economy and you think some of these recession calls are overdone, then, you know, a bullish, you know, commodity setup does make sense. And, you know, other factors as well, you know, we've talked about the China recovery being, you know, very much faltering, but the headlines from China are still coming on the stimulus front. It was yesterday, was it one trillion yuan for their property fund? At some point, this is going to have to have some impulse. And, you know, if China is the biggest buyer and is, you know, it, coming from a position of economic strength or begins to pick up, then yes, that you'd want to be kind of bullish on that front as well. And then, you know, the other things that we've seen this week, we've seen the IEA, OPEC, their all market reports, they've increased their demand forecast higher. And then also there's a policy decision at the end of the year, which we haven't really mentioned, you know, the rolling over of potential Saudi and Russian oil production cuts. So at the moment, you know, the kind of softness that we've seen in commodities does make sense. But yeah, I think there's a definite fear of complacency within the market when you think about geopolitics, the macro setup, then also the supply side from the major producers. Very much so. Uh, Mr. Paisy, you're our resident commodity expert in these parts. What would you be... Uh, what, <laughs> you're furiously shaking your head. Well, what are your thoughts on the situation at the moment? Do you think there is a bit of complacency settling into the market? Um, I don't think complacency is the right word. I think there's... I think level heads have come back into play. I think, you know, like Adam said, it's you know, mm. the, the, the spike that we saw um, in crude markets and, uh, and that fear that came in when the Middle East started kicking off. It, it was basically just the contagion trade. You were, you were, they were, you know, you were getting long on the fear that there's contagion throughout the Middle East, and you know, pr primarily everyone, you know, everyone knows it's primarily Iran getting involved and in the uh, the ever present threat that they shut off the Strait of Hormuz, which you know, it's incredibly unlikely that it, they do that, and it's less likely now than it it was, you know, a month ago. And I think something to be really kind of um, aware of, and it's something that me and Arno have mentioned on on uh, trading blows uh, a couple of times over like, over, well, over the course of the summer is that these reactions to weekend events and whatever in, in crude markets, especially they're you know, they're, the reactions in the market are getting smaller and smaller each time it seems to happen. And they're lasting for a shorter and shorter period of time. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy. Like we see some news come out of the weekend and you know, everyone's like, Oh, you know, a hundred dollar oil is going to be on Monday. We'll open up seven dollars. Um, you know, by the US market open, you know, it's back unchanged on the day. Um, and you know, there's a very easy way to make. It's a very easy way to blow your account is when you, you know, when you see these and you just think, oh, you know, it's going to keep going. These things rarely happen like that. Um, in terms of, again, Adam was spot on. I think, you know, it's, yeah, it's more of a maybe a China demand um, story more than a middle Middle East story at the moment. I think China demand or lack of Trump's Middle East tension right now. Um, something to be aware of, though, is you know these are not your father's energy markets, um, so we can't be comparing. You know, people love talking about the SP, uh, SPR and you know and how how that how little's in there and stuff like this, and you know the US will have to come in and step in. But this, you you know, everyone's comparing this to when. The U.S. was a massive importer of oil. U.S. is becoming slowly but surely becoming a massive exporter of oil. So they don't need that buffer of the SPR anymore because they're making so much of it domestically. Mm -hmm. So people really have got to get away from like trying to compare what's what we're seeing now and, and what we're seeing in uh, you know 10, 15, 20 years ago. So it's apples and oranges. And to be honest, that's the same for all markets. You know. One of my bugbears, well, I said one of the many bugbears I have, is <laughs> people comparing equity markets to like pre GFC. You know, the, the markets are no longer the same. You know, central bank reactions have changed. It's just so much money in, you know, swilling around the system. You can't compare old markets to what we have now. You know, you see people back testing and they're like, oh, you know, from 1990, it made all this money going forward. There's no point back testing any, if you, especially with equities, for instance. Again, we're even like recruit all markets. If you're back testing something, 
unless you're back testing a specific edge or whatever, if you, you know, fine. But if you're back testing just some technical analysis or whatever, or whatever you're doing, don't back test before the, the, the uh, 2008 because the markets are completely they're, they're hardwired different. Um, anyway, that's my little round on that. Um, but in terms of uh, going back to oil markets, that's what we were talking about. Um, OPEC, yeah, as Adam mentioned about um, you know the rolling over of the the voluntary cuts between um, OPEC, OPEC plus Saudi and Russia, basically. Um, it's you know if prices are anywhere around here. Of course, they're going to roll them over. They're not going to start pumping more because you know, the arse will completely fall out of the oil market. Um, I think it's important to, to mention as well that OPEC uh, last week kind of went full. Was it? Uh, was it? No, sorry. Was it Monday? When was the OPEC monthly report? Was it Monday it came out? Monday, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, I think so, yeah. They kind of went full, kind of, excuse the uh, pun, but they went full pump on the demand narrative. Do yeah. I get a point for that? Um, no. Am I going to point off? Okay. Um, you know, saying, you know, there's too much overhype on the, the lack of demand. But, you know, it's their job to say that. Um, personally, I think it appears that there's perhaps not as much demand out there as, you know, as we're seeing elsewhere. You know, we've seen Saudis cutting prices and whatnot. Um, yeah, so I'm struggling to think of a ball case for crude at the moment. Uh, in regards to, you know, my one little fact of the day for you on gold is last year, central banks purchased more than a foul, well, 1,100 tonnes of gold, right, which is the largest record in a single year since 1950. And gold pretty much didn't go anywhere. So you take out that buying, gold could be a lot lower. Um, you know, it's, you, if you're a gold bug, I feel for you because, you know, it's just, it's no life. Um, <laughs> so personally, I think commodities... Could easily just start drifting lower, and I don't, you know, God knows what's happening with coffee prices. Like cocoa prices at the moment, they're screaming like all-time highs and record after record. But that's more of a, a weather issue. And I know Dickie's not here. Dickie loves talking about the weather and the agricultural markets. But he's spot on. You know, if, if you're looking for a commodity markets to trade, and I'm sure you can trade them on Pepperstone. Um, point, please. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just you if you if you if you're, got, if you're desperate to trade commodity markets, I would step away from oil and gas and, and gold and start looking at, at the softs because I think there's far more interesting things going on in that landscape. Yes, I think you're right. I mean, you know, as you said, cocoa, coffee, orange juice, uh, cattle prices as well, screaming higher. Yeah. Um, and also by popular got, demand, Mr. You know, we got uh, El Nino. Uh, we got like only all this is like that we're going to see some huge volatility in agricultural markets coming up for the next six months. So that, that's where I'd be looking. Definitely. And uh, Mr. Matthews is back next week, I believe, so he can give us his update from the farm. Then, uh, right? <laughs> let's uh, let's finally go to you, Arno. What are your thoughts on uh, geopolitics and commodities and uh, anything else you want to squeeze in before we wrap up? Oi, oi. Sorry. Hmm. Oh. Not uh, not much really, to be honest. I mean, we we spoke about you know, geopolitics. What was it two weeks ago? Uh, where we spoke about the that usual tendency where markets tends to rapidly price in those risk premiums, and then they get used to it and they rapidly price out those risk premiums again. So I think that's what's happened to gold, and that's what's happened to to oil. So I think right now they're moving in the way that we would expect them to. You know, when it comes to gold, though, it, it's just such a dog of an asset to trade um, because it seems to, it changes its mind every day what's driving it, right? And there's going to be plenty of it's always real yield players out there uh, that, you know, if you traded that correlation over the last three or four, let's call it 10 months, you lost a lot of money. That's not an edge right now. Um, as well as, you know, it's always inflation. You know, go go take some take some data going back like Ryan said to the GFC, and you tell me whether gold is an inflation hedge. I don't think it is. So you can't trade it based on that. So sometimes it's positive. What is gold? Like, it's, it's, not, it's not even, you know, it's not even really a safe haven anymore. It's like, what, what's the point you in know, it? The, the, the only time, I mean, we've, we've done a couple of tests on this, you know, and the only time when gold um, is acting as a safe haven is with geopolitical risks. If you do, if you do backtest the data to, the zero to one percentile of equity um, downside days, gold is actually positively correlated to that. It's not negatively correlated to that, right? So you have you have beta in gold towards equities when the shit hits the fan, basically. So it's not a safe haven either, you know. So it's just it's a it's a horrible asset to trade, you know. So um, I think what we've seen is just that unwind in the risk premium, and I think that's about as simple as that. 
Where things get a little bit interesting more uh, is on the, the oil side. Now, I mean, I'm not, yeah, you know, I'm not a geopolitical or an oil expert, so I normally refer questions I have to, um, to, to actual experts out there. And I had a chat not Ryan, with, presumably. with Tracy, Tracy from Hill Tower because I saw the, the ICE futures contract for crude just, ap- I mean, we are almost at record lows when it comes to positioning. So I shared this chart with her. I said, listen, are you watching this and how would you interpret this? Is this, is this a signal for, for bullish price action? What's your take? And she had something interesting to say. She said, based on their way of looking at the data, they saw that the majority of that massive flush low in, in uh, futures positioning was all from long specs that basically dumped out their positions to the tune of something like 200 million barrels worth. It was a huge uh, flush. But what she also added was that there was almost no increase in short positioning. That was just a dump from long specs. So they're actually looking at this as a decent, you know, intermediate term or medium term buying opportunity from a spec perspective. Um, obviously, assuming you know demand holds up, which I do think it will. But if 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 uh, if, if demand changes, obviously obviously everything changes. But assuming we get a rollover in December, um, with positioning being this stretch to the downside, they're actually expecting a little bit of upside momentum from oil. Um, if if personally, if I'm going to trade something like that, I would like to see. Momentum change first a bit, you know, picking a bottom is just not worth it. Wait for the markets to rally a bit, um, you know, show you that there's momentum. You can always buy later. Uh, Normally, that's my preference. So that's something to look at. But again, you know, from a geopolitical point of view, I wouldn't trade this geopolitics wise, not right now. Um, And, you know, when it comes to gold, I mean, you know, that's I would just ignore it. (laughs) Well, I think that is very sage advice on which to end the show. and Have a look at the scores. Uh, right. Well, I don't know how he's managed to do it. Uh, it must have been that pint he bought me last night. But Ryan, well done. <laughs> you Thank have, you. Uh, somehow, you're somehow victorious, mate. Well I've got a feeling there might be an issue with your button there because I think I've got some points. Maybe you shouldn't put some points. I'll take I, th- I think of, of all the possible excuses we can have for you having won the show, there being a technical problem is probably the most likely. Uh, right. Uh, thank you very much to the gents for joining us. That does bring us to the end of another show. Arno Venter from Capital Edge, Ryan Paisley from PIQ Suite, and Adam Linton from New Squawk. Uh, thank you also to Kerryakos for bringing the show together as well as he always does. And last week's show as well, because I forgot to thank him on camera for that. Um, we will be back with another episode this time next week. If you've enjoyed the show, drop a like on the video, leave a comment as well. Let us know how you're trading the markets, and we'll see you in a week's time. Thanks again, and goodbye for now.